hit it <laughs> hit it yeah yeah oh wait wrong hey. series sorry no wrong se I engage there we go yeah yeah that's good <laughs> <laughs> welcome everybody to uh the unready room i almost said positively trek that's how unready we are um i'm dan gunther with me as always the amazing brandy jackala brandy no you are you today? are <laughs> I, there could be two amazing people you know it's, it's true it's, you. it's true it's you. yeah no it's you it's you <laughs> um yeah i'm 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 well i've got a little bit of um phlegm going on mm, so if i have to clear fun. my throat i'll mute i'm sorry it's uh it's been very rainy and wet the last day with high winds and oh. there was a thunderstorm while we were watching as a movie we were actually watching guillermo guillermo del toro's um, pinocchio and it was Very during good. it's an amazing movie guys go see it yes uh, watch it on netflix just watch it and there is a scene with the storm and so the storm is happening and then the storm outside our house is happening we're like was that in the movie or was that outside? Ah, oh, some tell. lovely pathetic fallacy going on. That's great. Yeah, it was really <laughs> bizarre, really bizarre. So That's funny. Well, I, I mean, that wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility for a thunderstorm to be going on during this episode of Picard because it, mm -hmm. it's got a lot of that going on as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a dark episode. Uh, in parts and a bit of a great awesome episode in other parts actually the whole thing is yeah i'm okay i'm gonna warn everybody at this point here we are talking about uh season three episode four no win scenario and i'm going to spend the next however long we're here gushing about this episode same it's so good mm -hmm. y'all it's so good <laughs> <laughs> I, I've already done that on another podcast, um, the Make It So podcast, um, mm, nice. the most recent episode of that. You can hear me and Luke gushing and gushing and gushing. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's gush worthy. It is a Absolutely. very gush worthy episode. Uh, yeah, we've got so much going on. We've got uh, great character development with uh, Picard and Jack. We've got... Jonathan Frakes putting in, I think, his best performance ever, which is, mm. uh, which is saying something. Uh, I, wow, Riker in this episode, amazing. Um, Shaw steals every scene he's in, uh, whether <laughs> it's per usual. comedic or not. He's <laughs> yep. incredible. Uh, Seven of Nine, amazing kind of thing she's got going on in this episode, and. Uh, and Picard himself, a great little arc through this episode, and, and especially on the heels of what happened in the last episode, uh, I think there's some just really great character development for all of them here, not to mention plot development. You know, we finally uh, get out of the nebula. We learn the nature of the nebula. We um, kind of move on from the current circumstances, and I think we're kind of getting into the next chapter of the story next week. Oh, really, really a lot going on in this episode. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss of, as to where to start with this one. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's just so much on every front. Um, I don't, I don't know either. We're uh, flip a coin, I guess. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that just gives you heads or tails. That doesn't help. Let me get my <laughs> 10 sided die out and we'll see. If <laughs> there you <I> go. <laughs> Well, let's uh, let's start with um, the circumstances the Titan is in, because that's kind of where we left it last episode. We had that that uh, controversial line among fandom when Riker says, remove yourself from the bridge. You've killed us all. And we mm -hmm. kind of continue from that point where Picard walks off the bridge and the Titan is tumbling towards an asteroid field down this gravity well in this in this nebula nebula. And uh, <laughs> Things look pretty bleak and we get that really great scene between Picard and Riker right at the start of this episode where Picard's alone in the dark and Riker comes in and Picard starts to apologize and Riker cuts him off and says, Jean-Luc, we're dead. We're falling towards this gravity well. There's no way out. I suggest you go talk to your son and you get your affairs in order. And then Riker says, you were right. I should have 
done certain things earlier. We, we shouldn't be in this mess, yada, yada, yada. And it's, I love that because it felt like two old comrades, two old friends who blew up at each other a little bit, mm -hmm. which happens, but it's like moving on, moving on. Like you were right. I was wrong and vice versa in some cases. And, um, what's important now is the situation we're in and, and all of that. I, I love that. That was just a perfect scene. Well, that is how true friends operate and they have known each other mm -hmm. for decades. So it's, it's one of those things where uh, do you, you never get along with anybody 100% of the time because mm -hmm. everybody has different things going on and everybody you know, there's no one exactly like you also on this earth. You know, even if you have a twin, they're still not exactly like you. So there's always going to be something. <laughs> Thomas Riker has entered the chat. <laughs> <laughs> but that proves what you're saying because they're not the same person either. So yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> and I was actually just thinking of twins in real life, but okay. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> genetically they were the same person but anyway um yeah so you're you're never going to get along with anybody 100 percent of the time there are going to be disagreements different points of view but the whole point of oh brandy froze on my screen i don't know if that's her or me uh oh i I don't know if people are hearing me right now or if I'm the one that might be frozen. But uh, hopefully things get back to normal shortly. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, really good point. I really appreciate that point, Brandy, for sure. Um, you're never going to get along with anybody all the time. And, and it's a testament to their friendship and their long working relationship that they do kind of come back from that the way they do. Um, Riker in this episode is something I really want to talk about because, um, okay. So it was Brandy. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Oh, uh, hopefully she's back shortly. It looks like internet had a little bit of an issue there. So, um, yeah, I guess you're just stuck with me <laughs> in the meantime, but, uh, yeah, that's a good point. They they were both wrong and they were both were right as well um, in various ways. So uh, it looks like Brandy is back here. There we go. <laughs> Internet's been fine until, of course, I'm doing a live show. So there we are. Of course. Sorry, guys. All good. That's just the way it works. But uh, yeah, I was I was kind of want, kind of wanting to talk about Riker. Uh, in this episode just because like i said the the performance that frakes put in is just so incredible and felt very real and i saw some people commenting online i mean i love 90s star trek that's what i uh, grew up on and and all of that but there were a lot of strictures in place as to what characters could do and feel and how they relate to each other and i feel like a lot of that maybe put a lot of chains on what kind of emotional state the characters could get into not to mention just the state of television at the time where it was very episodic and, and you couldn't have long running arcs and all that kind of stuff generally speaking um Riker in this episode just shows such a depth of emotion and uh, you know dealing with what's gone on with his family and the situation that he's currently in and the parallels that he sees between that and what's been going on in his life where you know he says he came to escape that feeling of emptiness and and you know desol desolation and stuff and he looks out the window and and here it is that's <laughs> mm. just that's incredible there's so much good stuff for him in this episode there is and i like how he confronts the whole you know i've never seen anything in everywhere we've been that shows me that there's something after this. Mm. He's afraid that there's nothing. He's afraid that there's no kind of afterlife. And I say again, 
energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change form. So it depends on your interpretation of what is after, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I really like this comment here. Uh, so there were a lot of people wondering if Riker was a changeling because, you know, he was maybe purposefully sabotaging things or something like that. Um, I don't think it was a deliberate bait and switch, but the part of this comment that I really like, a changeling imposter? No, that's what depression and grief can do to you. It can make you into a different person. It can make you seem like a stranger to the people around you. And in this case, the people around Riker are us, the fans watching. And that just goes to show what an incredible depiction of that grief and depression uh, that, that was written here and that Jonathan Frakes delivered on screen. Just gorgeous. Agree. And that's the thing is people think, people still think that grief is something you get past. It isn't. It isn't. Mm -hmm. It changes and you learn how to live with it, but it doesn't ever stop. And yeah. that can alter how you react to life. Yeah. And and I've seen that where people are saying, well, they, they seemed well in the episode Nepenthe. What's going on? And like, yeah, that could have could have caught them on a good day. They're seeing an old friend or something like that. And, and maybe they've been going through this the whole time. But there's also an interesting point that I think think it was trek cultures video brought up where they were saying like the events of season one could have been a, a huge trigger for riker and his family because the whole reason that thad died was the ban on synthetics and all of this stuff and that's mm -hmm. what season one was all about that's what was going on that was being played out and then by the end the ban is lifted which you know if can you imagine what's going through Riker and Troy's head during that time that like, if this hadn't have happened in that narrow period of time where this ban was in effect, their son would be alive and well today. Like, can you yeah. like ripping open an old wound? I, I think honestly, like that, that little bit of backstory, I can kind of fill in a little bit if it's needed. I don't think it's needed, but if you do need that little extra thing as to why, they might be feeling this more now than they were at that time. That's a really good explanation. Yeah. I like that. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll put that in my head cannon. I go for it. Yes. No, I think it makes a lot of sense. So kudos to uh, Trek culture and, and their video, which made me go, huh, that's a good point. Good point. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah. That was their ups and downs video, which uh, they always do a really good job on for sure. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, they're, um, they're spiraling towards this gravity. Well, little to no hope they've still got a changeling on board and that's the storyline that seven of nine and ultimately Shaw end up dealing with. Um, I kind of enjoy that. I love, uh, seven of nine acting still in an unofficial capacity as per Riker's orders and, uh, trying to suss out this changeling and, she seeks out Shaw for some advice. And one of my favorite little bits was the door chime ringing and Shaw going, don't come. Don't come. Don't come. <laughs> Fine. Come in. <laughs> oh, man. That was great. Hey, oh, yeah. That's, uh, you know, that, that honestly, I, I feel Shaw. I, I really do. It's like he's he's injured. He just wants to be left alone and he he's irritated that he's not in charge anymore. All of these things. And then to have the person come and see him be seven. So yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. He's uh, not in the best mood mm -hmm, for sure. But she, she well, gets his attention really quickly. <laughs> yeah. The fact. So interestingly enough that there's a changeling on board, but that the changeling came aboard before this whole thing with Jack and, and all this started. So, you know, this is something bigger. This is something big going on. That's involving um, at least the Titan, but it sounds like all of Starfleet or something because this existed very early on. Um, 
And for some reason, I really enjoyed Shaw not being able to come up with the word pail or bucket. <laughs> just, he's like, his, his pot. I assume you're not referring to cannabis. No, sadly. Uh, his pot, his vase, his receptacle. <laughs> and I'm like, pail, bucket, come on. <laughs> Well, it does, you know, what's what's the difference, really? I mean, I'm sure that there are things that designate it as a pail or a bucket over a pot or a vase or something. I just love Is it because vase. buckets have a vase. handle? Just for... I mean, <laughs> just... Oh, man. Yeah, that was great. That was great. Everybody shouting, bucket! <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've got uh, this pad that he, you know, finally just calls it up on the pad and shows and it's Odo's pail and a little nice picture of Odo in the corner, which, um, yes. you know, it's it was nice to see Odo. That's really the only way we're going to be able to see Odo, of course, because of, of the, the very sad passing of René Aubergenois. But uh, that was lovely. I was just I had to pause there and just be like. Miss Odo. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm going to interject at this point and say, uh, if y'all haven't watched the Ready Room episode for this week's episode of Picard, go do it because A, Todd Stashwick, mm -hmm. and he's fantastic. And B, they give you a really nice comprehensive primer on the changelings. And hmm. you'll get to see a lot of Odo in that. So. Oh, interesting. That's cool. Pretty sure narrated by the same actor who played the, uh, I guess, leader, you know, it, which he actually had been in an episode of Next Generation when they went on that archaeological hunt and they all ended up at that same planet and the Klingons were all pissed that all it was was knowledge. And they're like, you know, <laughs> that's so, all. If she were not yeah. dead, I would kill her. <laughs> <Best one. laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same actor, same actor. So uh, she's got a very Salome distinctive Jens. voice. Yeah, yeah, very distinctive voice. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of Odo and his people and his bucket, uh, and I see this come up in the comments as well. It's very weird that this changeling's bucket <laughs> is the same as Odo's, which I have to imagine is a Bajoran bucket. I think mm. he got it when he was yeah um my weird head canon is this guy's a huge odo stan i don't know <laughs> right <laughs> sure let's do that um, even though he's on the of... side that's like opposing odo he's like still some sort of well, weird like yeah well that's the thing though if uh, if it weren't for odo they'd all be dead so yeah <laughs> that's true that's true <laughs> good call yeah he's just a big odo stan i love that he's just yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's go with that i'll put that in my head canon too yeah otherwise it really doesn't make a ton of sense but that's okay <laughs> um speaking of things uh, we'll come back to seven and shaw and the changeling in a bit um but speaking of things that don't make a ton of sense but just go with them anyway because it works for the story uh and you and i have talked about this uh earlier but the holodeck the fact that um and this comes from voyager actually and it didn't make a lot of mm -hmm. sense there but it's what we have uh the holodeck has a separate power source that for some reason according to harry kim is incompatible with the power systems on the rest of the ship um Okay. I mean, they can plug in alien devices into their computer, but they can't get their holodeck battery to talk to the, I don't know. But uh, basically it was so Voyager could have holodeck episodes, even though they're supposed to have energy rations and stuff. Uh, but they use that here to have the holodeck be um, kind of like a, a, a safe place to congregate, which is cool. I kind of like it in the context of the story. Um, doesn't make a ton of sense just as much as it didn't make sense in Voyager, but it is pre-established canon. So mm -hmm. points for going with that. That's, that's pretty cool. But, um, I do like that they have the 10 forward bar to kind of, uh, hang out in for this, um, as, as a bit of a shelter, a little emotional shelter almost from what's going on outside. 
Yeah, and I think that that's the point. And for me, that's what justifies the whole separate power cell so that mm -hmm. the holodeck can work even when everything else isn't because it's a place where people can congregate and uh, support each other, both you know physically and emotionally and mentally. So, you know, I'm I'm fine with it. Yeah, it doesn't make a ton of sense, but also neither does warp drive. So I don't care. <laughs> you know, it doesn't oh, yeah. bother me enough. <laughs> it doesn't bother me enough to take me out of it. I just I made no. a joke about it at the time that it happened. I said, Dave, Dave, they're doing the Voyager thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, and it and it works. So it, it's yep. a nice, I mean, for plot purposes, for dramatic purposes, I think it serves the story quite well. So Agreed. Uh, stuff like that, I'm more willing to let go than things that don't. So uh, that really works um, because we get some great scenes in the holodeck here. I, I think this is the real heart of this show and these characters. First of all, between uh, Picard and Jack, and I, I just got to say his son, right? Get, get used mm -hmm. to that idea. Picard and his son kind of learning more about each other. And uh, I, I loved this scene where Picard's talking about um, the, you know, times that he was in that were as bad as this or felt as bad as this, this shuttle trip with Jack Crusher and, um, I thought was a great story, obviously from a period in which Picard was not yet the captain of the Stargazer. They borrowed a shuttle uh, to go to Argelius IV for, <laughs> for mm. purposes. And uh, yeah, we're on their way back and got hit by micrometeoroids. And um, yeah, they were. Uh... <laughs> okay. One little thing I want to talk about, because I've seen people talking both ways about this, and I have a really great uh, quote by Terry Metalis about it was um, Picard's dropping of the F bomb, which mm. some people have kind of gotten in a, in a tizzy about the first time, the first time I watched it, it was a bit of a record scratch moment just because like, I've never heard Jean-Luc Picard say that word. My goodness. The second Haven't time I we watched though? it. <laughs> nope. Nope. That was really this. This was the big moment. Yep. Um, the second time I watched it, it's, it fits so well in the story he's story he's talking because I think it's kind of brilliant because it flashes you back to him as a young man and what he was thinking and feeling at the time, 10 effing grueling hours. And it's just, it seemed, I, I thought it worked really well. I, I actually really appreciated it the second time. Yeah, it didn't bother me the first time either, because, you know, the the F word is so versatile. You can mm -hmm. use it in so many ways. And it's not against God or anything like that, because people have, you know, certain people have problems with taking God's name in vain or whatnot. And so it's it's just it's never bothered me. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. there are far worse things he could have actually said without even swearing. So, yeah, yeah. it just, uh, I was just like, oh, yeah, that, that would have been grueling. Because having to switch from this to that, and they were blind, had no sensors, you know, they could have lost control of that shuttle at any time. They could have lost atmospheric control inside the shuttle. There are so many things that could have gone wrong. And... Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that was that was almost a no-win scenario right there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is okay. Now this is really cool. I didn't know this. Uh, Doug Drexler posted this. Um, it, they, were, they did an interview uh, with Terry Metalis about the show, and and this came up, and that was unscripted. That was not in the script. That was Patrick Stewart. Oh. Which All right. I thought is really cool. So this is what Terry says in this article. I wasn't there on the set that day, so I had not seen it. When I got the director's cut, I was so taken back, aback by it, but it was so real. And everything you do as artists, as writers and actors, even as editors, is authenticity. That's the thing you want to feel. I was really torn because hearing that word come from your childhood hero, Captain Picard, it throws you. 
But wow, it is powerful. And it's a moment between a father and son. This moment didn't come easily. Uh, um, and Metallus questioned whether they should even go there with Picard saying, so this is a quote from him is again, at first I said we should look for an alternate and everyone talked me out of it. Everyone said, no, 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 no. And then you start to go back and ask yourself, is Gene Roddenberry rolling over in his grave at this moment? Are you going to get the backlash to the first time that word was used in season one by another character, which did not go over well? And yes, probably. Even though to this day I am uncertain about it, the conclusion I came to is, yes, Star Trek is about hope and optimism, and certainly cursing is not really in that vein, but it is also not just an exploration of the final frontier, but an exploration of humanity and the human heart. And that was such a human moment and real. It had to stay in. I stand by it, and the criticisms will be valid for anyone who doesn't like it, and anyone who does are equally valid. So... I love that. I love that that was just a choice made by Patrick Stewart. And yeah, like he was in that moment and it feels so real. So I love it. <laughs> yep. I have nothing yeah. further to add because my view on swearing <laughs> is that uh, you have to know a language in order to break it and use it in ways that may not have been intended. And so. Mm -hmm. You know, people think that uh, people swear because they're stupid. That is not the case, actually. Absolutely people who not. swear are often more trustworthy and more intelligent. So, damn right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to hell with everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'm being a bit hypocritical because, you know, I don't want a video on YouTube to get demonetized and pushed down in the yeah, rankings no, because that's a decision YouTube has made. So uh, hence my yeah. little uh, uh, asterisk in the name and all that stuff. But meh, whatever. Yeah. And I, and I should <sighs> say that we had we had picked the same name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I changed my name. <laughs> well... <laughs> Yeah, let's get to that scene then, because this to me was just a show-stopping, jaw-on-the-floor, terrific moment in this episode. Uh, we have get other officers coming into the holodeck to kind of take refuge. Is this private? No, come in, sit anywhere. Um, and eventually, Captain Shaw comes in and this scene just ratchets up the intensity slowly but so well where you know picard's been telling this story about him and jack on the shuttle uh the elder jack crusher on the shuttle and shaw kind of says like oh it's a you know good story good story did your old man ever tell you about the story when we first met and mm -hmm. you can see picard's face kind of looks over and he knows what's coming like at first mm -hmm. he's like, well, and then he's like, oh no, like he knows what, what's going on. Um, because like we saw an interaction between Picard and Cisco that has a lot of the same feelings behind it. Cisco couldn't say probably what he wanted to say because they're officers in a situation, yada, yada, yada. And it makes me wonder how many times that has been repeated with Picard. Maybe not mm. a full conversation like this, maybe not a full anything like this, but like the looks, the glares, the like furtive glances, you know, that kind of thing. Like how many times has he experienced this with other people? And he responds to it in the way he's probably responded a million times before. Um which we'll get to, but first of all, Todd Stashwick just delivering this incredible performance saying, you know, he recounting the story of him on the Constance and uh, being a grease monkey from the lower decks and, and being chosen to be one of the people to go into the escape pod and that survivor's guilt and that questioning why. And do you know where your old man was during all of this? He was on that ship and, Oh, and you hear in the background, I am locutus of Bulk. Mm -hmm. And it's just, oh, it's so good. And and the emotions on Picard's face where he has to sit here and take it because there's nothing else he can do in that moment. Like, yeah. you know, and, and Jack goes to defend him when he says that's enough. And Picard's like, no, no, I just... 
gets up and leaves. Mm. You know, he says, I understand. What else can you do? Yeah, I, yeah. I understand. And, and, and the thing is, is that nobody <sighs> is ever, when they have that kind of reaction, nobody is ever thinking about what it was like for Picard. Mm -hmm. Does Do they think that he chose that? Have they just forgotten the part where it wasn't his fault? Yeah, and I mean, these are all the things that Picard, in some part of his brain, would want to say, but you can't mm -hmm. because no. because Shaw's experience is understandable and real, and he needed to get that out. He, you know, and it, and like, a, and and like I was saying, Picard responds the way I'm sure he's responded to this hundreds of times before. I mean, not hundreds, however many times before. Which is to say, I understand and leave and then probably wrestle with his demons for an hour or so after that, because mm -hmm. he's in the corridor and you can see he's just like, like he's a mess. And probably every time that happens to him, it messes him up again. And I just, my heart was breaking for Shaw, for Picard. Uh, even for Jack, who is like, he he was in an awkward position there. He's like, I was going back and forth, like, Ugh. and then he wants to defend his dad, which is, that's, that's a great moment there. Um, oh man, there's so much going on in this scene. It just it, like, if I still taught a film studies course, I would show this scene. It's so good. <laughs> it is. And uh, Shaw's reaction when Picard just says, I understand and leaves because mm -hmm. he wanted, he, it's like he wanted a fight. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he didn't get it. And now he's kind of deflating and thinking about, Oh, what did I just do? Yeah. Yeah. And you and can see that in his eyes. Yeah. And like anytime there's a, there's a situation like that, the other person wants to provoke something. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, whether it's something that's like deeply personal like this, where it like it's understandable or like there have been times when um, <laughs> I've been I've been working. Uh, um, I, I used to work at a gas station and so people would pull up and, and they'd start spouting off about whatever um, the last the most prominent one I can remember is somebody was talking about how uh, we'd recently at the local public library had a, a drag performer doing the reading to the kids thing. And he started going off about how that's an adult performer and it's an adult thing and blah, blah, blah. And, and at first I said, no, it's, it's a person reading stories to children it has nothing to do with any of that. Well, they're, you know, this, this transsexual, blah, blah. It's like, no, no, no. He's a drag performer. He's not, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and even if, even if he was, what does it matter? Blah, blah. And he just kept escalating and I turned around and walked away and I, mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's the work situation I was in. I could do that. Um, right in the middle of him ranting about something and he was so spitting angry. And I just, Mm -hmm. You know, he's looking for a fight. He's looking for either somebody to agree with him and go, yeah, blah, 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 or someone to get in his face so that he can keep escalating. And I'm just like, okay, well, walk away. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's always the best choice. <laughs> always mm -hmm. the best choice with people like that because you are not going to win them over to your point of view. You are not going to be able no. to deal with them rationally because they have already proven they're not rational at all. Mm -hmm. So the only thing to do is not engage. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, there's some parallels to what's going on here, but like this is more meaningful than than that yeah. dipshit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> From Chicago. This is a different. No, this this is a different. This is a self-proclaimed dipshit from Chicago um, who's uh, has some valid concerns and valid trauma that he's dealing with here. Um but yeah, there's, there's nothing you can say in that moment that's gonna, you know what, even, even if Picard sat there and said, your feelings are valid, let's talk about that. Th he's in no state to talk no. about this. No. 
that's the best thing that Picard could have done. And then, like I said, he's now going to, for the next however long, wrestle with his demons about it because you can see that on his face. It's ah, oh, it's so heartbreaking. <sighs> and then comes what I think is Shaw's best line so far. Yes, which I wanted to somehow use in my uh, name. But uh, yeah, his, at, at some point, oh shoot, I got to get the wording exactly right. I did, I wrote it down here. Um, uh, oh yeah, it's at some point I substituted, shoot, what's the line? <laughs> at some point, a-hole became a substitution for charm. That was it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah such a good line and the i i loved that because that was such a that was a captain line because he looked around and saw his crew going like we don't know how to react to this we don't know what's going on our captain is unhinged maybe uh what's happening and that was a line to kind of like make everybody like oh <laughs> now we can move on <laughs> mm -hmm. you know like deflating the tension a little bit and hitting that release valve. And obviously the tension isn't released for Shaw, but he's doing that for his crew. Yeah. He, the thing is, is that Shaw wants to protect his crew. He wants mm -hmm. to keep them alive. He absolutely does. He is not a terrible captain. He's just an no, a-hole some not. of the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay let's let's get back to shaw and seven then because there's some other really really great moments uh when they're yes. talking about the changelings and stuff um so when shaw's talking about how to detect a changeling one of the things is like you know talk to them um get them to to they they don't know enough about people's lives and she's like oh you but you need to know everything about everybody on board to do that <laughs> Shaw's line. Oh my God. Um, look, you and I got off, got off on the wrong foot. I underestimated you. You have great instincts. You're a natural leader. Make a great captain one day, which is something I totally would say at seven. Oh, if you were a changeling and not just a dick. Yeah. Now you're starting to catch up. <laughs> that was so good because even the music of the episode goes along with the joke. Like the mm -hmm. music starts to say like, oh, this is, this is the real Shaw. You're getting to, now you've broken through the, 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 the rough exterior. Now, like the music starts to sound like nice and spread. And then, no, <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, that's what I'd say if I was a changeling. Right. Now you're catching on. <laughs> I love it. I'm so good. Oh man. Well, and, and the interesting thing is the reason, because there's the whole thing with, um, seven still being relieved of command and Shaw is too and that basically is why she went to him because mm -hmm. she's in an unofficial capacity and so is he and she had yeah. really she couldn't involve anyone else and for whatever reason she at least trusted him enough to come to him and tell him what was going on so mm -hmm. There is something there. <clears throat> anyway, but yeah, I love yeah. that entire scene. That was so good. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, the little bit. So, okay, we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but one of the things they have to do is um, uh, release the caps or the, the covers of the nacelles to... We'll get to what they're doing exactly, but that whole scene where um ensign laforge comes in and seven of nine has stepped out and they've set kind of a little bit of a trap uh and she says you know i'm just here to help commander and seven's like commander what commander hansen zap <laughs> you know, like she always calls me commander seven out of respect and shaw's like yeah Ah, good call. <laughs> Goes back to work. But like, there no, is this no promise that he's ever going to do it. But he's like, ah, that was good. yeah. <laughs> there, there, there is that look in his eye for like half a second. Like, half yeah, second. okay, yeah, 
I yeah, okay. But uh, and he's so good at that. Todd Stashwick is so good at that. It just you can see things in his eyes for half a second and know exactly what that character is thinking. It's just yeah. Well, and it's and they were prepared for it. That's the thing. They were totally prepared for it because he he basically said, you know, if if a changeling were going to attack, this would be the exact time and place to do that. Mm -hmm. And so they were just kind of waiting for that. No. Plus, honestly, would anyone really believe that Sydney is going to leave the bridge yeah. at, at a critical moment such as this? Come mm -hmm. on. You should have chose somebody better, dude. Or dudette, yeah. whichever gender you may have been. And what's the deal with um they're still in solid form after dying? What is up yeah. with that? That's interesting. So the body looks like it kind of ripples and is gonna, and then it comes back. Yeah. So is she dead? Is she not dead? What's going on? So uh -oh. I'm pretty sure she's dead. <laughs> or <laughs> they are dead. Because I don't know, you know, they've been multiple people so no. it's hard to say whether this uh, changeling is identifies as male or female or maybe neither i don't know no and i mean even when changelings are unconscious they tend to revert to their liquid state so yeah so this is going on here this is a change for these changelings yeah. sorry that was terrible <laughs> they've uh i was trying to think of something with shapeshifters but it's not working so anyway <laughs> <laughs> they've shifted nah whatever um, <laughs> so uh all right so while this is all going on uh we're jumping back to previous in the episode now crusher dr crusher is timing these weird pulses that are happening with the biological component and i joked last week that these pulses make the lights on the ship actually work uh which mm -hmm. goes double this week because the lights are actually all off this week and they do come on so hmm um but uh yeah she's timing them and they they seem to be getting faster and she realizes their contractions and their the the nebula is the amniotic fluid basically of whatever is about to be born um just interesting and they bring that to Riker and, and Riker has this fatalism right like he really feels like this is the end and it takes a bit to snap him out of that. It takes Crusher and Picard kind of both saying the right things to kind of snap him out of that. But they're convincing him that um, the, there's there's this life form that's about to be born. There's these waves of contractions and they can use the energy of that to power, to repower the warp core. And they can ride those waves out using the thrusters. And Riker you know, says there's a million things that can go wrong. It'd be certain death this way. We're at least waiting for possible rescue. And there, everyone knows that that's the actual hopeless, like that's not going to happen. So um, I did enjoy Like I felt really sad for Riker and it was tough to watch him being so mm. fatalistic and looking down and seeing the flashing ready to record message to Deanna Troy thing. And like, that was brutal, but, you can tell that moment where he's kind of like walking. <laughs> he does he does such great work physically. He's walking out of the conference room slumped. And Picard says that final bit to him that says, you know, let us do what we do best and all this stuff. And he turns around and he walks back in and he's got that Riker swagger. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> yes. You can tell before he even says a word, the glint in his eye and that little bit of a swagger. You're like, he's on board. He's on board. I love that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. My my only niggle about the whole tracking the contractions thing is that the counting was never consistent. <laughs> It was like you are doing more than one second between that and you hurried up on that last one. It was just, come on, guys, get a metronome in there or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's something that. that like when people are, because I notice that in every movie and TV show when people are counting like that, unless it's like two o'clock or something like that, it they're always way off. So mm. I, I always try to ignore that because it would drive yeah. me nuts. Well, yeah. it it would normally it doesn't bother me that much. But 
the first time we see Beverly counting, that's really like two seconds between each number that she's counting down. And then she yeah. hurries up on the last one and it's just, uh, uh, mm, no, that's too <laughs> noticeable. It's too noticeable. But no. yeah, I'll no, let I it go. Because sure. it, it doesn't it doesn't lessen my enjoyment of the episode overall. It's just a niggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Riker does get on board though. And uh, Jack mentions the space babies. <laughs> Riker goes, space babies? Um, which, you know, he's a little incredulous at, but like Beverly says, you know, it's not the first time. And like, there's at least four just in TNG and more outside of TNG as well. So mm -hmm. it's not that, uh, not that uncommon. Um, so yeah, they're going to ride these waves out. And of course, uh, in true Star Trek fashion, that whole sequence of them from having to power everything down and put it all into thrusters and then Seven and Shaw working on the nacelle covers and getting them off just at the last second and Riker having to divert all of life support power as well for those few seconds. This was like ratcheting the tension up and it, it's Star Trek. You know how it's going to work out in the end. You know we're going to go through A, through B, through C, but it's so well done here. It felt so good. It felt, yeah, like somebody said, we now join Star Trek The Next Generation already in progress. That's what this <laughs> felt like. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, and again, kudos to everybody on the bridge. That bridge crew is top notch. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they, they, if they were asked, they voiced their concerns, but they never, you know, you never heard any rumblings. They were quintessential bridge officers on a Starfleet vessel. And yeah. you couldn't ask for better than that on any bridge. They were yeah. exceptional. The one part I really noticed that and I loved is, is that moment I was talking about where Riker's walking out of the conference room kind of slumped. And you, if you look past him, you see um, the, the helm officer and the ops officer, LaForge and the, the Bajoran fellow, um, they're standing at their stations with their hands behind their back, just kind of like watching the conference room, waiting to see what the verdict's going to be. And mm -hmm. I, I just, there's something about that, like the ship's dead. They're, they're, you know, there's just nothing for them to do at their stations. They're just waiting on the decisions of the older, more experienced people to tell them, are you going to live or die? Are, are we going to try to live or are we just resigned to this? And I, I mm. there's something about that of them just like waiting for that decision. I love that moment. It's, it's subtle in the background, but it's there. Yeah, I noticed that as well. Because mm -hmm. I'm always looking at the background. I'm like, what are people doing yeah. in the background? Because <laughs> it's always interesting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah, they they undergo this plan. They're riding that last chalk wave. Of course, it's the last chalk wave. That's that's how these things work. Uh, they get yeah. all the energy into the warp core and this nebula. Um, well, first of all, Vadix waiting for them we've seen a bit of her where she's communicating with the superior of hers. Um, What's cutting... that about? What? I kind of, the first time I was like, what the heck is happening? I I'm thrown out of this because I can't even figure the second time. Like, okay, it's some sort of communications thing. And she's using a part of her body and the like computer, or the, the system is using it to generate the view screen image. And I'm like, okay. I can get my head around that. But at first I was like, I have no idea what's happening. I have just, it was almost too much. Um, second time I kind of got my head around it a little bit and was actually able to kind of pay attention to what was being said. Cause the first time, like I said, I was just going, I don't know what's happening. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Well, and the interesting thing is that, you know, it confirms my suspicion that Vatic is not the big bad. Mm -hmm. Um, and that she and that everything is expendable except for Jack Crusher. Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. <sighs> I'm still going to go with that some 
the form of it's going to be him you reuniting these people with each other with the great link that's that's what i'm going with for now still i haven't had anything mm. to dissuade me of that yet so we'll go with that no yeah. well so yeah they um vatix they're waiting and we get that incredible scene i i love this so much um the titans barreling towards <laughs> towards the shrike and you know vatix gonna get them and Riker. <laughs> puts a tractor beam they've they've recharged their systems so they have power Riker says do we have enough power for the tractor beam yep direct it here he grabs that asteroid and just slams it into the shrike i love that that was beautiful um it was star beautiful. trek insurrection gave us something called the Riker maneuver i think this should supplant that as the Riker <laughs> maneuver <laughs> because <mwah. laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, tossing an asteroid at an enemy ship, the Riker maneuver, because yeah. <laughs> that was the best. That was in an so episode great. filled with amazing dialogue. This was some of the best. That was great. Yeah. And <sighs> and we were all, we were all just right there with him. So yeah, yeah. so satisfying. So satisfying. Yeah. You throw a ship at my ship, I throw an asteroid at yours. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that, that was, was excellent. That was amazing. So good. So yeah, they they get out, they go to warp uh, right after the this nebula explodes into these little tiny little jellyfish. Space squids! Squid things. I love them. <laughs> Space squids. I want a plushie now. Make a plushie. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That was cool. It was pretty neat. I like space dwelling life forms. I think uh, the idea of like outer space as an ecosystem, I think like there, there's a really great actually Star Trek Titan novel um, that has to do with a lot of like space dwelling life forms and stuff. Um, Orion's Hounds, I think it's called. I think Christopher L. Bennett wrote it uh, really, really good. And, and that one really fuels the idea of like outer space sorry i hit, hit my microphone there outer space as like an ecosystem with different environments and life forms and stuff and they they revisit like the jellies from encounter at farpoint and a bunch of others too so it was pretty cool yeah well and and aaron mcdonald also uh on the ready room episode uh 304 is uh, talked about nebulas and how nebulas yeah it's uh it's basically a cloud full of stuff stuff mm -hmm. there's stuff in there <laughs> so yeah. it can it can have a gravity well it can have all these all these weird things in them and just because it's a nebula that doesn't mean it's exactly like another nebula you've seen like you know so mm -hmm. but uh, yeah there's stuff in a nebula and stuff going on that we don't know about so no think about that the next time you see a picture of a nebula in space like real no picture of a nebula uh i've seen people asking this i don't think these are the same as encounter at farpoint they look a lot different it's kind of like that yeah. one in um lower decks in that lower decks episode where yeah like people are comparing it to farpoint but they look very different so i think there's a bunch of the different things out there yeah well go back and watch the end of encounter at farpoint and you'll see that they're very flat their their heads are very mm. flat or bodies are very flat like a saucer so they yeah. don't look anything they might have you know tentacles and such but these very much more looked like squids to me well mm -hmm. space squids. yeah they had like definite eyeballs and stuff so yeah or or what yes. looked to us like eyeballs anyway i don't know yeah it looked like eyeballs to me too so yeah uh so yeah the the titan gets away they're at warp away from the nebula um but we get one last little bit here which is Jack Crusher looking into a mirror and yeah, this weird stuff going on with him. Definitely I still weird have stuff. No idea. I uh, I'm still going with it was planted in him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we get the scary door anyway. and it opens all the way and there's some scary stuff in that door. It's like the door opens all the way. And Jack is going like full on manic, like hitting his head and stuff. And then that door in his mind opens and we see that flash. And now suddenly he's like stops and he looks in the mirror and like, is there something changed there? It feels like something changed in him there. 
So I don't know. Yeah. What it all means, I, I have no idea. Yeah. So nothing is certain at this point, except that uh, something is talking to him. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it's in his imagination or whether it's actually talking to him, that remains to be yeah. seen. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, one last thing I want to mention, no Worf and Raffi this week, which I think was a really good choice because it really yes. kind of feeds into the like isolation and how cut off Titan is from the rest of the, the universe right now. It feels like everything we see is on board Titan other than the bits we get on the Shrike. And I think that was the right choice. Like it feels very contained and kind of oppressive that we don't get to escape this nebula at any point mm -hmm. to see what else is going on we're stuck there with them so i like that yeah i think as much as i want choice. to see more wharf and raffi but we'll get and there <laughs> we will we will it's yeah. i mean obviously we will so it's it's not a problem for me uh, but yeah i didn't even really think about that the first time i watched this episode is oh where's raffi where's wharf it didn't mm. occur to me because there was so much going on. And I think Absolutely. if they had broken that up with a B story, that it would have been jarring. So, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Brandy, final thoughts, anything we haven't discussed and uh, maybe a rating for no win scenario, which I mean, I think I know yes. <laughs> the level of rating anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, there's one scene uh, in in the holodeck 10 forward that uh, I remembered, which is um, when Picard is asking Jack to talk about himself. Mm. And in, instead Jack recounts, you know, a kind of mission that he went on and you can just see the disappointment come yeah. across Picard's face and how, you know, because he was just trying to connect on a personal level and Jack is still being guarded and not giving up anything. Mm -hmm. And that hurt him a lot. So, yeah, uh, this episode was amazing. Um, it's my favorite of the season so far, but we still have, what, six episodes to go. So that might change. But as of right now, uh, it's favorite of the season so far. So I... Uh, I give this one giant dip leap from Chicago. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I mean, this episode, I, it's my favorite of season three so far. It's my favorite of Star Trek Picard so far. It might be my favorite episode of Star Trek since season six of deep space nine maybe i don't know like it's Ooh. i love this episode it was really good i think start to finish um the acting the writing uh the character building the the sense of of fun mixed with the sense of like true stakes and peril i i just i love this episode um like i said this is just me gushing about this this whole time so um i'm i don't know much more what more i can say about it that i haven't already already said in this stream so um i'm gonna give it oh goodness um i'm gonna give it one entire nebula full of uh space babies it was yeah. terrific yeah um if i'm giving it a number john 11 out of 10 i think that's pretty close <laughs> yeah excellent it's pretty close <laughs> yeah. yeah uh yeah a log entry by picard that was pretty cool that was admiral's log started blah, blah. Ooh. <laughs> that's cool yeah um, I'd, I'd forgotten about that until i rewatched it on mm -hmm. thursday and uh we haven't had a lot of logs in this season of picard yeah yeah interesting it, it yeah it felt like old school trek and that was just like a little bit of a, a capper on it uh to just be like here's your roots guys this is where this is what it's all about and uh yeah i loved it yeah 
Well, the captain's logs or any officer's logs are great for short exposition. So mm -hmm. telling instead of showing. And and that sometimes it's a lot faster than showing everything. Yeah. So I have no problem with that. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I noticed something about captain's logs on the show versus like in novels and stuff. And in novels, they they tend to actually be like a good paragraph of like actual exposition about what's going on in the story. Like it's it's a kind mm -hmm. of a nice and I I I don't use the word crutch as as a pejorative, but it's kind of a nice way for the author to really get like here's what the story's going to be about that um out really quickly. Whereas the TV show sometimes it's like is this really an official log because <laughs> It's it's like it's always a little tease. It's like Captain's Log starting blah blah blah. We're in the FICA sector and it's given us an opportunity to welcome an old friend. And like that's the sorry, that's the end of the log. And I'm like, who's listening to this at Starfleet? They're like, I need to know more, please. <laughs> <laughs> and then like it goes to the scene and like looks on a Troy walks in and you're like, oh, okay. But it's like is that an official log? <laughs> it's just a little like teaser. <laughs> I, I think that we're only getting the beginning of the log. We're not getting the whole yeah, log. I think so. So too. it's 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 an abbreviated log, a truncated <laughs> log, if you will. <laughs> I hope so, because sometimes I'm like, put a little more effort into it than that. Like if I was at Starfleet Operations, I'd be like, get me Captain Picard. Uh, he's gotta, he's, this is not good <laughs> yeah it's like your your logs are one sentence long stop that <laughs> we need specifics oh. you know this yeah absolutely i think i've gotten all of the ratings i'm not seeing any more pop up um but yeah <laughs> ah the pro log i like that okay <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> oh well with that said um i guess that's probably it for this week thank you all so much for joining us i'm looking at the clock and it's like wow i was i haven't been watching the clock this whole time and we're like an, um, an hour and a minute that's kind of awesome um we did well so yeah brandy thank you for joining me uh you were recently on an episode of what was it again make it so Make it so the Make it so podcast. podcast. Yes. Yeah. Um, anywhere else that we might be able to hear your voice? Uh, uh, well, not yet, but I've done a, a couple of episodes of a Babylon Five podcast called A Dream oh. Given Form, and uh, they haven't been released yet. But uh, I have been invited back for uh, cover. Well, I covered an episode, a two-parter actually, in season one, and. Uh, they the the host told me to uh, pick out some episodes that I would like to do for season two, and I'm like, oh, I will. <laughs> you can't nice. get rid of me now, because I did watch Babylon Five as it was originally airing. So, yeah, That's cool. it's uh, very near and dear to my heart. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Uh, and anywhere people can follow you online. Oh, yeah. uh, Brandywine12 on Twitter, um, Brandywine at Brave Nation dot whatever um yeah mastodon <laughs> i'm still figuring it out it's fine and uh yeah excellent if if i'm if i'm in this it's on something in something you'll find it on twitter too so randy my 12 perfect and yeah um at kurtrats on twitter for me at kurtrats.mstdn.ca on mastodon for me and uh the positively track podcast of course which continues to chug along. Um, excited for an upcoming episode. We've got uh, Jesse Earl, Jesse Gender from Twitter coming back on the show to talk about some yes. pretty cool stuff. Uh, yes. Very excited about that. And uh, yeah, our most recent episode had John Jackson Miller and returning host Bruce Gibson talking about John Jackson Miller's uh, latest novel, the Star Trek Strange New Worlds novel, The High Country. So that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you all so much for watching. We'll see you next week for imposters is the name of the next episode. Wonder what that might be about. Um, we'll see you then live long and prosper. Goodbye. <laughs> or two.